offered anything. Especially the offering. Well, if you don't give it, it's not good to get in touch. I know, but when it comes to offering, that's one thing I want to make a point to do because I don't want to rob anybody from the blessing of God. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. Because when we give, we give to God. Amen. <coughs> but we've been talking about what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse. And just reiterating what we're comparing it to is a person who works out all the time. He gets lean, mean, and buff. That doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes consistency. It takes effort. It takes work. Same thing is true in our spiritual lives. If we're going to become Pentecostal powerhouses, strong in spiritual things, it's only going to come through work, through effort, through consistency, determination, intentionality, if that's even a word. It's going to be us making a point to become, make sure that we are becoming strong in the Lord. Just a refresher, we began talking about faith, because it all begins with faith. Even the atheist has faith. But ours begins with the faith in God. Amen. And from there it grows. Do you remember what the enemy of faith is? Yeah. Doubt. Doubt is the enemy of faith. And then we talked about the importance of prayer and then coupling that with fasting and reading your Bible and until finally we got to the armor of God. <coughs> <coughs> and how much of the armor of God are we supposed to put on according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4? That is correct, but that's not according to 2 Corinthians 10, 4. That was my fault. According to Ephesians 6, 11, it's the whole armor of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 instructs us and informs us, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. <coughs> and I'd like to stress right here, if you notice, there are several things in this verse. Our weapons, they're not carnal, so they're not physical. And how are they mighty? Through God. Not because of us, but because of Him. <clears throat> well, how does that tie in with us becoming a Pentecostal powerhouse if it's through God? Because the closer we get to God, the more that we read our Bible, the more that we pray every day, the more that we do our devotions, the more that we are consistently building that relationship with God, the more powerful our weapons become. The more we shun the things of this world, the more we put away sin and stop doing them, the mightier our weapons become. And we need the weapons because they're guard, to guard us, they're to protect us. We've already said, and we've said it time and time again, God said, put on the whole armor of God. When we first started talking about the armor, we talked about how many enemies do we have coming against us. We had the little diagram or chart and as we ran through the Bible, we saw we had one enemy, we had two enemies, we had three enemies. And so finally, all we know is that the angels, while innumerable, the devil took a third of them. So while we might be battling one enemy at one time, there might be a come with time come when we're being battled by enemies all around us. And if we only have part of the armor on, well then we're not properly equipped for battle. We're susceptible to injury. We're susceptible to the enemy coming in. Last week, we talked about the shield of faith. Let me get to my notes. But when we talk about faith, every man is given a measure of faith. But our faith can grow and our faith can shrink, depending upon our relationship with God. And we talked about how there were several different types of shields used throughout history in warfare. You had one that was small and round that you could maneuver real quick with. And there was another one that was larger that could, you set in the ground, use it as leverage. And it provided a whole lot more protection. Our shield is dependent upon our relationship with God. And as I'm following through my notes, give me a second, I'm not multi I can't multitask very well.
But we need that shield, and we need to have our, allow our faith to grow. The Bible talks about our shield, our shield, our faith, however you want to refer to it as, beginning as a grain of a mustard seed. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's very, very small. But as we read the Word of God, He instructs us that our faith should grow to the point that those birds can rest in. Well, what do birds eat? They eat seeds. So while our faith was once vulnerable, we allow it to grow to the point where even the predator can no longer take it away from us. And when we look at faith, our shield of faith, and we move on looking at today's uh, part, they're connected. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Ephesians 6, 17, if someone will go ahead and read that. So today we're going to be focusing on the first part of that verse. There's no notes today. I didn't get that far. Oh, Time slipped okay. away for me. Okay. But we're going, to, we're going to be looking at the helmet of salvation. When we look at a helmet, what's the purpose of a helmet? Protect the brain. Protecting the brain. Protecting the head. Protecting the skull. Protecting the temples. The Roman soldiers wore helmets to protect their heads, and not just the top part, but the sides and the back as well. And their helmets actually went a little bit farther than just the head. It helped protect the neck as well. They were designed in such a way it allowed their ears freedom to hear. Because what good is protection if you can't hear what's going on around you? You gotta hear the enemy coming, you gotta know what's coming on. If there's somebody screaming close to you, far away, that's all important. If I'm in a battle, I wanna know where everybody's at. Well, you, your eyes are very important here, too. And your ears. Your eyes and your ears your are Your eyes are very important. important for a battle. Absolutely. And when we look at helmets throughout history, some of them were designed using thick leather. But as time progressed, they became composed of metals. We find this in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 5, using a biblical illustration. 1 Samuel 17, 5. I will go ahead and find that one. Samuel chapter 17 and verse 5. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So here we find that there was a helmet that was composed of brass. Why did they have one composed of brass versus uh, thick, thick leather? Because metal is stronger than um, leather. Brass, yeah, brass is stronger than leather. I don't know if I said that right or not. But it's all about protection. Throughout history, as armor increased, it was all about protection. Making it lighter, making it more duty, heavier duty. So the helmet is extremely important. It's used for protecting the head. And when we look at the illustration that Paul has given here, as we've been talking in the past, Paul's not been using these as physical weapons in the spiritual armor, but rather that He's using the physical weapons or the physical parts of the armor as an illustration so the Corinthians or the Ephesians would have a better idea of what he's talking about. We know that Jesus did this with spiritual things. We call them parables. He took earthly stories and gave them heavenly meanings to try and give insight to his followers. Paul was doing exactly the same thing with the armor. It was an illustration for the believer of the responsibility, responsibility of him guarding and protecting his mind. The mind is an extremely vital organ. It is the seat of the soul. And it's one of the major components of the body. When struck, it can cause sudden fatality. It is that important. When we look at the Word of God, the Word of God talks
talks about important parts of the body or important organs in such a way that they belong to God. Or we should, I should phrase that better, not belong to God, but we should make sure that they are healthy, modeled after God in the sense that what did David cry? I think it was Psalms 51 after he sinned with Bathsheba. Create in me a, a clean heart. And what did Paul write in Philippians 2, 5? Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. So throughout the Word of God, God instructs us that we need to have a clean heart, but he also instructs us to have the mind of Christ. So he's showing us how important it is for us to reform these important organs of the body, that they would be more Christ-like, that they would be more uh, created in the image of God. Those old earthly things be cleaned and done away with, and that our mind and our heart should be modeled after spiritual things, after heavenly things, after Christ. See, when the Christian heart... Christ deals with your heart more than your mind, right? He wants your heart. Am I correct? He wants your heart, yes. We, we say that God comes and lives in our heart because that's our seat of emotions. Bottom. Go ahead. But God expects us to reform our whole body into something that would be pleasing <coughs> to Him. He wants... What, because what's laid in the mind is a product of the heart. Okay. Everybody that you say God speaks to them, they say he spoke to my heart. Why would they say he spoke to my brain? Doesn't your brain come up with that? Oh, they could just be saying that God's speaking. It's just a way to phrase that we're saying God's speaking to me. Okay. Or God spoke to my heart. So he spoke to me on an issue that um, dealing something I'm dealing with or something I'm going through. Or he spoke to me on a matter that's personal to me. I mean... Same thing could be said if um, the pastor's preaching and you know he mentions something that's dear to you and you, you know that's something I need to work on. And you can say the pastor spoke to my heart. You heard it with your physical ears, right? But it's something that maybe you're going through, or something you need to change in your life, something that you need to apply to your life, something along those lines. But when we get saved, there is a struggle between the carnal man and the spiritual man, back and forth, and that deals with the mind as well. It's not just the heart, but the mind. Because Paul wrote in the book of Romans that those things which I wish to do, I do not. And those things which I wish not to do, I do. Well, what is that saying? That's saying him as a Christian, maybe he desired to read the Bible every morning, but his flesh got a hold of him, he didn't want to wake up early enough, time progressed throughout the day, he ran out of time, and just got pushed by the wayside. But he, he wanted to read the Word of God. It's just as God away from him. He got his eyes focused on other things. Because we do that without, throughout our whole life. You know, when I first received Christ, it seemed hard to follow Christ. Because I still wanted to live my, live my sinful life. Mm -hmm. But it seems now, them sins don't bother me. It seemed easier to live for Christ. You understand what I'm saying? Those sins I don't know if you get what away. I'm saying. The, the closer, I guess, the closer you get to Christ. The sins don't bother you much. As in the fact that they are pushed away. Drugs, you're drugs and running with people that, that you know. If you run with them, you end up drinking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You understand? You don't yeah. want to kind of run with them people, and that don't bother me anymore. No, but when you first got saved, there was that struggle that yeah. you didn't want to, but yet you wanted to, and there was a struggle. And that's what Paul's yeah, talking about. Yeah, and then you had other Christian people, like a counselor was helping me, a pastor was helping me in Harrisburg years ago, and I run the gang and stuff. Um, he claimed I was going to get shot, I was going to die by a bullet. But, but it, 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 it was hard back then. You know, when you hear people say, <coughs> I'm going to say, when, when you, back then in my younger days of getting getting uh, what do you say saved it did seem harder and then when you said that at a Bible study or something people look at you, you know well, if you give your heart to the Lord it shouldn't be hard to to live for the Lord you mm -hmm. understand what I'm saying yeah, you hear some people 
I hear some people's testimonies that when they have an addiction or something like that, like a guy was on cocaine or something, when he received God, all of a sudden all his bad things went away. Mm -hmm. well, that didn't happen to me. You know what I mean? I mean, like it seemed like he was perfect. You know what I mean? All his addictions and all his sinful ways went away. But but to me, it happened in, in seasons and sections, I guess you'd say. And in it, time. It is different for some people. Sometimes, like you said, it is instantaneous. Sometimes it's progressive. Yeah. But how does, and just because it's instantaneous doesn't mean that we push it up, say, well, now I'm perfect, but it's a constant progression. And like you said, it took time. It took spending time with God. Right? And when we look at the Word of God, that's exactly how we renew our mind, is by focusing on the things of God. What does Psalms chapter 63 and verse 6 state, and also Psalms 107 and verse 8, Psalm 107 verse 8? And if someone else will get Psalm 63, 6. You say Psalm 107, 1. And verse Someone has Psalm 63 and verse 6. Then I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in, in the night I rejoice. So here we have the writer of the psalm saying how he rejoices when he thinks about God and meditates upon him at night. He's meditating on the things of God. What about Psalm 107 and verse 8? Oh, that man would praise the Lord of the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that man would Amen. praise God for his wonderful works. What is that? That's a right going back, that's a remembering, that's a meditating, that's a thinking upon those things of God. How do we protect put on the helmet of salvation? How do we protect our head? By remembering the good things that God's done, meditating upon his word, and remembering what he's done for us. Meditating upon the scriptures, maybe that we read or studied. Why is this important? Because it's important that we have control over our mind. Because guess where the enemy likes to attack? Your mind. He likes to attack your mind. Right. Place thoughts in there that shouldn't be there. Your lies. Place lies in your, in your I think it certain stuff to me, I gotta watch when somebody does something to me right away, I don't wanna hurt them, you understand? Absolutely. And then it goes to let Christ handle it, he won't get no trouble. And then the other thing with the enemy too is, it's not just a matter of him feeding us lies, but he does it in such a subtle way that he tries to make, disguise his voice and our voice and make it think like they're our thoughts and disguise them in that manner. And it's important for us to make sure that we have control of our thoughts, we find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Let me just back up to verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So it's important for us to judge and weigh our thoughts. Are they of God? Are they not of God? Even though this sounds like my voice, is it according to the word of God? Or is this, uh, what this voice is telling me to do, is it contrary to the word of God? You know, we need to bring every thought into subjection and determine whether it's of God or whether it's not. Well, then you should go to the Bible. You, you should. You question in your brain and what I was told with a Something <coughs> comes into your brain, and you shouldn't be asking other people about, uh, about, about getting an answer for that. You should go research it in the box and get the answer for yourself Absolutely. out of the box. But I think, even, and I could be wrong, but even in the day and age we're living in, uh, 
I've been agreed by the amount of things I've been seeing, especially in the last year or two, about suicidal thoughts. I've seen somebody post already on Facebook about, um, I get suicidal thoughts, but I'm not suicidal. Well, you tell that to anybody who's picked you up in an ambulance for anything, or you tell that to a doctor, guess where you're going to be going. Are suicidal thoughts of human nature? That's, that's a sign of depression, in my, my opinion. They, they took me to Philadelphia and behaviors and the fight. But um, where are these thoughts coming from? That's the thing. And if they're not, and they can might sound like our voice, but do they well, line up with the word of God? You, what do you mean there? I mean, if you're depressed, you can get all kinds of weird stuff about killing yourself and about ending your life. I mean, depression. Well, let me ask you. Thank God, I mean, some people tell me depression pills, they had me on anti-depression pills, and I was supposed to get off of them because they're addictive. So I got off of them. But, but, but I pray now about God and you about depression. Mm -hmm. you and you should, because he's the one that can deliver us. But just suicidal thoughts in general, are they human nature? Is it natural to have suicidal thoughts? I would say yes, in this world. So let me ask you this. If somebody comes in and points a gun to your head, you're going to say, go ahead and shoot me. Yeah, well, because I'm not afraid to die. Well, that's one thing. Most human whatever. nature tendencies to live. I mean, live. I have guns pulled on me already, and you can never outrun a bullet. I mean, if you can't get away from the man, you better be able to strike. <laughs> because, or you better be able to get your thumb in behind the tree. But most human nature is not to die, but it's to live. Right, you want to live, and when but, we look but at I mean, the Lord, if your time is going, Justin, and you're right with the Lord, and you feel you know where you're going, what's the difference? That's one thing, but is it human nature to say, just go ahead and kill me, which it is not. No, no, If you point not, a gun no. to most people, they're going to say, oh, don't kill me. Correct. Does suicidal thoughts line up with the word of God? They do not. They do not, no. So, if it's not human nature, and it's not of God, then where are these suicidal thoughts coming from? No. They're coming from the devil. I'm even not. though they might sound like our thoughts, even though it might sound like our voice, the devil slips in, and he tries to destroy us. And it's important for us to bring every thought and imagination into captivity for that reason, to judge it if it is of God or if it's not. Because if we go back to the days of Noah, that was the problem. Every man's imagination was continually wicked. Their mind was wicked. They didn't have the mind protected. First of all, they weren't of God. But Noah, he had to guard his mind. If he was going to be a man whom God could use, he had to protect his mind even back then. Correct. He had to guard it. People lied to him and called him a mind man. You know. But we also need to do the same thing as well. We need to make sure that we're guarding our mind from the attacks of the enemy. Does that mean that he'll never, ever penetrate? Absolutely not, because even the best slips in there from time to time. <clears throat> but it is our responsibility to guard our thoughts. It's our responsibility to judge them, to see if it's of God, because we need to be protecting our minds. To go back to like suicide, like you were saying, you should know that it's not God putting that in your brain, because God is about life. You know, God came to give you life, eternal life. What about the person who's never been to church? What about the person who doesn't know better? Oh, yeah. You got a point there. Yeah, he wouldn't because know Because we are living in a society where even the church world claims to be Christian, and there are a lot of people in the churches that really are not Christian and can be easily deceived. See, the devil's walking around to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Which is kind of why we're doing this Bible study here, because it is our responsibility as believers to make ourselves strong soldiers in the Lord. Yes, he has called us sheep and followers, but he's also called us to combat. He's called us to battle. He's called us to prayer. He's called us to evangelize. He's called us to heal the sick. He's called us out to tell those who have never heard of the gospel. We are soldiers for the Lord. And if we are weak, then the army of God is weak. Not because of who he is, but because who we are allowing ourselves to be. We are living in a world that if no one else steps up, if we don't step up, is anyone else going to step up? If we don't tell somebody about Christ, is someone else going to reach them? 
if we don't lay our hands on the sick to see them recover? Is someone going to, else going to do it in our place? That is what we are looking at. We need to make sure that we are strong in the Lord. And it's going to first begin when we find ourselves in a place where we are working on our relationship with God and becoming strong in spiritual things. There are a lot of people in the church world today that they cannot even handle the wheat meat of the word because they are still only able to handle the milk of the word. They can't handle the strong. They can't handle the deep things of God because they have not equipped themselves for battle. They have not studied the word. They don't know what it is to use the shield of the spirit. They don't know what it is to pray. They don't know what it is to fast. Why? Because they've allowed themselves to stay weak in spiritual things. Whether it would be them, uh, their own fault for not reading the Bible, not studying it, not developing a desire, or rather, maybe because of their leadership. But the Word of God is sure that we need to equip ourselves. We need to make sure that we are becoming strong in spiritual things. That we are equipping ourselves with the shield of faith, with the hell of salvation, making sure that we're guarding our mind. Making sure we're guarding our heart. Because when we look at the church world, how many people may preach about the rapture? And while it may be even fewer than it has been in the past, because I couldn't tell you the last time I've heard a rapture message. How many people who are, are actually going to go in the rapture? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow there is, is the way that leads to life. Why? Because few there be that find it. And if we're going to find it, it's going to be with us protecting our minds by putting on the helmet of salvation. See, the helmet of salvation gives, a, gives us, a, we can get a better understanding of it by reading 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 5 8. If someone would go ahead and read that, please. Maybe 
maybe we didn't experience anything through our feelings. But we have to rest on the Word of God, knowing that when we ask forgiveness of our sins, that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That's not always a feeling. But we can 